Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I have a really unique project that's gonna cost me about $100 in material and about 10 hours of my time. And in the end, I'm gonna to try to sell it for a $1,000 profit, and I'm gonna do it all anonymously. Stay tuned. I have a lot of people that watch my channel that are aspiring woodworkers or maybe weekend woodworkers like I was just a couple years ago. And for these people, it doesn't make sense to go out and spend two to $4,000 on a big slab of wood to try to sell a dining table for $10,000 before they even have a client. So I wanted to come up with a project that I don't want to say anybody can do because you do need to be somewhat of a woodworker to do this, but it doesn't take a ton of skill or really even a ton of tools to build what I'm going to show you how to build here. It's basically going to build two hand sculpted end tables. And like I said in the intro, I'm going to put these up for sale under an alias Etsy account and I'm gonna try to make $1,000 profit from it. I have a lot of pretty expensive tools. However, a project like this doesn't necessarily require this level of tools. So you'll see throughout the video, I put a lot of annotations up at the top of the screen that give a cheaper alternative to the tools that I am often using here. Like this is my bandsaw. However, you don't need a perfect circle here, so you could use a jigsaw for this portion. And if you wanna keep track of the cost, this two inch piece here cost me $44 total or $22 per table. Each of these pedestal sections that is about three and a half inches by three and a half inches cost me $10 a piece. So, so far I'm into it $64 total. I'm using my domino to help with the alignment of my base and the pedestal section. However, it really isn't necessary for a job like this. It's gonna make the alignment a little bit easier and you could also use a dowel However, if I didn't have a domino, I probably would use just the epoxy bond by itself. I wouldn't use a dowel or a biscuit or anything because this epoxy bonds really well to the end grain and it's gonna be more than strong enough to hold this together. It's just during this glue process, it's gonna help prevent it from kind of twisting to one side or another. And this was a little bit awkward. You see that I thought I had it and it didn't like the way it lined up even with the domino. So I had to take it off, set it on there again. And eventually I got it, but it was a little bit awkward to get. One thing to keep in mind is that you want to keep your grain running essentially parallel to each other, meaning the end grain on your pedestal section should run essentially the same direction as your table base. And this is for wood movement so that they both expand and contract at roughly the same rate. and There's no cracking or separating down the line. While the epoxy sets up over there, I'm going to get started working on the tops. And here I'm using my track saw to cut one straight edge and Track saw is great, but it's a tool that most weekend warriors can't justify the cost for. So recently I made a YouTube short where I showed how to turn any saw functionally into a track saw. So if you want a little more information on that, I'll leave a link in the description for that video. I have some insanely beautiful offcut pieces of wood in my shop from past projects that would have made unbelievable tops for these end tables. However, I felt like that would be kind of cheating and not really approachable for most of you guys doing the same project. So. I have kind of a little hack to make cheap wood look like expensive wood, at least with walnut. And what I do is I use that light edge, that sap wood, and I line them up together to make it mimic a book match. And this is actually pretty inexpensive wood. It was about $40 for that entire board or both boards. And that way you get the high end look, but really the cheap cost. This next bit was a little bit of an experiment because I've always wondered why there wasn't some sort of outfeed table jig for cutting circles on your router table. So I decided to drill into my outfeed table and make my own. And all this was was the top of a 16 penny nail that I cut off. And I'm going to end up drilling an eighth of an inch hole in my piece that it can kind of rotate on that little center pivot pin. And this will make sense here pretty soon. So all I did was line it up, get it in there so it spins. And I used a half inch straight cut router bit. And I just raised it up into the wood piece slightly as I rotated it around. I made a couple shallow passes, raising it up just a little bit at a time until I made a circle that was cut about a half inch deep. And some of you might be wondering why I didn't just cut the entire circle on the router table. And when you cut circles like that, you're always at risk of blowing out as you raise it through the wood. So there's a chance that as that router bit came through the wood, it would splinter it out and it would look really, really bad. So it's a little safer to do it like this. So with a bandsaw or a jigsaw, you cut as close to the line as you can and then you're going to use something called a flush trim router bit. And that's what this is here. And this is a really good one. This is a spiral bit. I highly recommend the spiral bits. They cut so much better. They last so much longer. However, this one you'll notice is burning the wood really bad. And I actually had two of these bits. 
and I couldn't remember which one was sharp, so that one told me pretty quick that that was the dull one. So put a sharp one in there, let it ride, let it ride right against that first groove that I cut, and this one cut really well. And this is gonna give you a perfect circle, whereas if I cut the circle on the bandsaw like you saw the jig at the start of the video, there's always these little bandsaw skip marks, and you don't want the blowout of using the router table, so using a combination of the two was what worked for me best. A few weeks ago in one of my videos, I threw out an idea to you guys of whether or not I should create a database of different maker spaces of shops that will rent out tools and time to your average Joe for an hourly rate. And that idea kind of took off. People seemed to really, really like it. I got tons of messages, tons of comments about this database. So I made it and I've gotten hundreds of submissions already. We're on, I think, like five continents and it's really exciting. And so what I would like is if you are a maker and you have some tools and it doesn't need to be a huge shop, maybe it's a shop similar to mine, you've got a planer, a jointer, some good sanders, and you wanna generate a little bit of extra income, throw it up on my database. I bet there's people just down the street from you that would love to be able to use these tools, pay a small fee. You make a little bit of money. They don't have to invent, invest $10,000 to get their shop started and this could really open up woodworking to a broader audience. So I'm excited about the idea. I'll include a link in the description. So if you have a small shop, throw your shop up there. If you are looking to be able to use some tools like this and you don't think there's anywhere around you, check out this database. You might be surprised. Now that those tops are essentially ready to finish, I'm gonna work on sculpting these table bases. And first off, you see me wandering around here because I lost my custom molded earplugs that I've had for years back from when I used to fly. So I'm pretty bummed about that. Now I have to go back to an ear doctor to get more of those made because they are worth it. Anyway, for the shaping of these bases, I'm using primarily different cut saw wheels. And this is their contour dish or contour wheel in a die grinder. It works really well for getting that first shape, the very bottom, the base. And I do recommend starting at the base because that makes everything else flow into it a little bit nicer. This is one of their dishes and it started to get a little bit wobbly. So then I put a little bit of weight on it Right here we have the Arbortech, and the Arbortech is nice. It's not made by Cutsall. It removes a lot of material, but it's not that nice of a finish. So if you wanna buy like 10 discs, I recommend getting the Arbortech. If you're just gonna buy one or two, I recommend getting the Cutsall. And this is one of my favorites. It's their extreme shaping disc in the coarse grit. They don't really ever get dull because they're made of this tungsten carbide. You can actually clean them off with a blowtorch because carbide doesn't get affected by heat like normal steel. So they are really cool, really versatile tools. And I've had, I don't know, about four or five of these. I don't think you need to buy that many. I recommend getting probably just the fine disc if you're gonna have just one of these. If you wanna get two, I would say get this blue one here, the extreme disc and the fine. And that's probably enough to do all the carving you need. I should mention that Cutsall is a sponsor of this video, but it's also worth mentioning that I don't work backwards when it comes to sponsorships on tools like this, meaning if a tool company reaches out and says, hey, please make a video about our product, we'll pay you. I don't do it that way. What I will do is if I'm making a video anyway, I'll reach out to that company and just say, hey, I'm making this video. Would you like to be a sponsor? And then I can add some links or some pertinent information about your product. And Cutsell has actually sponsored three or four videos this way. They've been great to work with. So product that I really use, I genuinely enjoy them. And I would have made this video even if they weren't sponsoring it, but I just try to add a little bit of information in there for people, add the links they want that really helps bring the value to them. After I get it as smooth as I can with that cuts all fine disc, I bring it inside and I go to work with the spoke shave. And spoke shave is a really cool tool. I don't do a ton with hand tools and I probably should do more because this did an amazing job for smoothing out all those high points from that power carving which is gonna make it much easier to move on to the sanding process next. If you follow my page, you know that I've been trying to get better at this power carving for a while now, and I'm the first one to admit that I have not been very good at it. I made a couple pieces that I felt were okay. They weren't great, and I kept trying to get better, and I actually had about three or four pieces that ended up in the fireplace that I never even showed you guys because I was too embarrassed to, and this piece, I'm actually really proud of. This is the best one that I've ever done, or these two pieces that I'm working on here are the best pieces that I've ever done. And if I can offer a piece of advice from what I've learned so far is don't get too creative with it, at least as far as I was doing. I was trying to make these kind of wild curved offset, you know, Dr. Seuss looking bases, and they looked okay, but they weren't great. And this one, 
is just a little more timeless. It's kind of a modern take on a tulip base. And in the end, this worked out a lot better for me. It looked like a much more normal base, but it still had those hand carved aspects to it. So that's the advice is don't get too fancy with it. And maybe as I get a little bit better, then I can find out what looks good and then I can get a little bit fancier from there. In one of my earlier power carving videos, I had one of the viewers had left a comment letting me know that wood turners carve a slight recess in the underside and this allows the tables to sit pretty flat. And I'd mentioned this in another video where I did that and someone else commented, they're like, hey, it's not just wood turners. If you look at any bowl or plate or anything like that, they all have kind of a carved out center section or a hollow center section so it sits on a thin outer rim. And this is just enables it to sit much more flat. So I use that Arbitec turbo plane carved out that center section and it allows that outer rim to sit perfectly flat. For the sanding, I started at a very rough 40 grit and worked up through 180 grit and between the grits, I spritzed it with water or water popped, raised the grain. In theory, this gives you a smoother, nicer finish. I'm not actually sure if that's the case, but I do it anyway. And then on my final pass, I sand it with 180, blow it off with air, and now it is ready for finish. The finish I'm using is called Rubio Monaco. It's a hardwood floor finish, but you can use it in a very, very dusty atmosphere like my shop. You basically just buff it in. I'm using a white floor pad, also known as a scotch bright pad or a non-woven pad. You buff it in, basically keep going until it looks like it won't absorb anymore, and then just wipe off all excess, and that is it. It is really nice. I actually do two coats with it. If you want a little bit more information on my finishing process, I'll include a link in the description below with a full finish video, but it's really simple. Just buff it in and wipe it off. Even though I'm about to mention this, I guarantee I still get comments from people that will say something to the effect of, that project wasn't realistic for your average woodworker. Look at all those tools you have. That must be nice. And first off, yeah, it is. It's super nice. I highly recommend getting all these tools but you don't need them. I did provide tool alternatives throughout the video that really a pretty basic wood shop can have and purchase relatively easily. And no, this one project isn't gonna fund an entire wood shop, but a couple of them might actually fund a pretty decent small wood shop. And if you still wanna double down and say, no, that's stupid, I can't do it, or a normal person can't do this in a small wood shop, I actually love hearing this. And if you're another small wood shop, you should love hearing this too because that's one less person to compete with you because I promise you, you can do this. This isn't that hard. We still have to find out if it's gonna sell, which I'll tell you at the end of the video whether or not these actually sold, but this is a really pretty easy project you can do in about 10 hours in a relatively small wood shop. I've made several of these tables and I generally always mount them with the same steel plate. I bought a bunch of these discs from eBay and then I just drill my own holes, put some countersinks in there, and they make a really slick mounting system for these types of tables. I do get some questions and they're good questions. People ask me about wood movement because this doesn't really allow for any wood movement. And Katz Moses Woodworking actually just did a video where he really breaks down wood movement and people think that it's more than it is. And over a span this small, you don't really need to account for it because when you're doing like a 48 inch wide table, yes, then you don't wanna just rigidly screw your table base into that. But for something this small, the wood movement isn't really going to be a factor and this won't crack, and I have several tables to prove that so far. Now, when I put these up for sale, I didn't wanna use any of my social media because I do feel like having a large YouTube page and Instagram page is kind of an unfair advantage over someone who's just starting out. So I made a complete alias Etsy page, had nothing to do with Blacktail. I took some really good photos. I can't stress how important good photos are for your Etsy page, and I put them up at $1,200. I did do the advertising at like a dollar a day budget, and in eight days they sold. And they, with tax, I think it was like 1,300 and some dollars. I did pay for shipping, which was about $150 total. So all in all, I ended up profiting $940 from this project. All right, every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people that make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with whether you are a dog, cat, or neither person, because I want to know what type of people are actually watching my show. As always, thank you so much. Have a great week.